Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Export Market Development Grants uh, information session for the next round of the program that will open later in November. This session will specifically focus on the T3, uh, which is for businesses who are exporting to new key markets. Before we begin, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we gather today. We extend it respect to their elders, past and present. We recognize the enduring connection that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people have with this land, and we extend our respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples joining us today, acknowledging their rich histories, cultures, and contributions. We come to you today from the Gadigal land of the Aurora Nation here in Sydney and from the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. Good afternoon again. I'm Noma Gunich and I look after the EMDG delivery in here in Ostrad. And presenting with me today will be my colleague uh, Tracy Butcher in Melbourne, who is the manager of EMDG policy team, and my colleague Jumran Liu, who is the senior legal advisor. Some housekeeping and reminders, your microphone has been muted as you join this session and our cameras will be turned off if we are not presenting. Uh, we will be using Slido for this session today and you can start asking questions from now on uh, with using the hashtag EMDG. The purpose of today's session is to give you a brief overview of EMDG. Then we'll go through changes to the program uh, that resulted from the recent uh, strategic focus of the program. We'll go through the details of the next round, uh, the T3 eligibility conditions specifically in this webinar, and we'll also spend some time looking at how to prepare to apply between now and November. We have also set aside some time for questions and answers, and we really uh, will endeavour to answer all your questions. But if not, you're welcome to write to us at emdg.help at austria.gov.au, and we'll endeavour to answer your question as soon as possible. So what is EMDG? So most of you probably have applied in the program um, before. The program will celebrate 50 years uh, of existence next year. And it is a grant program for Australian businesses who wish to start and expand their export business. Applicants must match the grant funding and they also must um, uh, meet all eligibility conditions. Grants can be provided to Australian small and medium enterprises and their representative bodies to help them undertake export promotion activities or export training. There are four T's in the program currently, and we have retained that going forward in round four. So as I said, today in this webinar, we'll talk specifically about T3 eligibility conditions. But just to recap, there are four T's. T1 is for businesses who are new to export, and they must be ready to export. T2 is for businesses who are exporting and wishing to expand their exporting within existing markets. T3 is for businesses who are expanding their exports into new key markets or diversifying into those markets. And specific T for representative bodies that are supporting their SME members to either become export ready, grow their export activities, gain marketing skills, and also support their trade diversification. I'd like to hand over now to my colleague Tracy to take you through the changes of the program. Thank you, Noma. So for this round, round four, changes have been made to EMDG, and it's important to make sure you're aware of the changes before you apply, particularly if you're already familiar with this program. The changes to EMDG have been made to address challenges that we've had. In particular, amendments made as part of the 2020 reforms created much higher demand and delivered lower grant amounts. And for rounds one, two, and three, our most recent rounds, we've offered much smaller grant amounts. This is because of high demand and the need to allocate all eligible applicants a grant across multiple grant years. And we heard from stakeholders that was a big concern. Because of lessened eligibility criteria, we've seen a much higher volume of very small businesses. An analysis that we have indicates that these, some of these businesses are not going on to achieve export sales. Among these businesses, we also see a higher proportion of underspends, which may indicate that some of our previous applicants haven't been quite ready for the program yet. 
An operational review that was undertaken in 2022 found there was a need to better manage the program to balance the level of interest in EMDG with the available funding. And the budget is reducing to $110 million in 2025-26. And this is still a very good and substantial government investment in the program and small businesses, but we need to be able to make this program work at any budget. The changes that we have made to EMDG have been informed by stakeholder feedback, including public consultation processes. This includes an operational review of the program in 2022, a further public consultation process in 2023, which sought feedback about a range of options for the program. Then some targeted consultations about the rules and aspects of the guidelines were undertaken in 2024. This feedback, along with extensive data and analysis, has informed our changes. And we thank those of you who may have participated in some of these processes. The changes that we have made aim to maximise the benefits of the grants to businesses and deliver higher grant amounts. A key change we are making in line with other established government grant programs is that applications to EMDG will close once funding is fully allocated. This compares to our current approach, which allocates a proportion of funding to all eligible applicants and has meant that grant sizes can be very low in a given round because we simply don't know how many people might apply. By making the changes, we will be able to offer larger grant amounts to those that are eligible, and we can also let potential applicants know the maximum grant amounts that can be applied for. This provides more clarity to help you plan and prepare your marketing and promotional activities before you apply and decide if the program's right for you. There are now new eligibility criteria for small and medium businesses. The criteria aligns with businesses that can better utilise the funds. Changes mean that we're also encouraging certain applicants to diversify into new key markets that have been identified. So that applies to tier three applicants, and we'll talk a bit more about that later in this presentation. We're also making changes for representative bodies by seeking more deliberate planning and transparency about how EMDG is being utilised. And we're introducing some new compliance measures and applicants need to be fit to receive a grant, including meeting their tax obligations. The changes apply from the next round of the program, which is round four. Round four will cover a two year period. You may be able to apply for grant agreements for up to two years, depending on your eligibility. The approach provides certainty for successful applicants and reduces a need to apply every year. The round is for marketing and promotional activities planned for the 2025-26 and 2026-27 financial years. The program funding that we have for EMDG for those financial years will be fully allocated as a result of the application process that will open in November. Applications for representative bodies will open on the 6th of November. Then separate to this, applications for businesses applying for tiers one, two, or three will open on the 12th of November. And we strongly, strongly recommend you prepare well ahead of the opening date if you're planning to apply. And there's, there are steps that you can take to do this and we'll talk about those later. We will be opening applications until the funding is fully allocated across the tiers. And we'll be assessing the applications in the order in which they're received. Once the application period is open, we will regularly communicate the status of the applications for the tiers. This will be on the Austrade website and, and the online portal where you submit your applications. This is very different from previous rounds but it's an important way about how we're going to manage the program going forward. And it means we're able to set 
maximum grain amounts at meaningful levels. You can apply for one of four tiers. You can only apply for one of the tiers in a grant round. So you need to be able to choose the tier which you will apply for. So to do that, you might consider where you're at in your export journey and what your plans might be for the next coming years. This session is focused on tier three and we'll go through the eligibility criteria specific to that tier. Please carefully consider the tier that's right for you because if you apply for the wrong tier, you may be ineligible. For round four, maximum grant amounts range from $30,000 to $80,000 for the different tiers. The maximum grant amount for tier one will be up to $30,000 per financial year. Tier two, up to $50,000. Tier three, up to $80,000. And for representative bodies, up to $50,000 per financial year. This provides certainty for the first time about how much you may receive if you're successful. The minimum grant amount available for program or for tiers one, two, and three is $20,000 per financial year. There's no minimum grant size for representative bodies, but all applicants need to be able to match their funds. We anticipate that we'll offer around 1,900 grants in total for this round. So this session is for potential tier three applicants specifically. To be eligible, applicants need to meet all of the eligibility requirements for tier three. The full details of the eligibility criteria are in the guidelines and the rules and you can find those on the EMDG website. So tier three is for businesses that are exporting and have established export re revenue and that are looking to expand the marketing and promotional activities you already do and that, that are making a strategic shift and promoting to new key export markets. If this doesn't sound like you, another tier may be better. Webinars have been held that are specific for the other tiers and you'll be able to watch those shortly online when they're available. For round four, tier three applicants can apply for grants from $20,000 up to $80,000 per financial year. We anticipate offering around 650 tier three grants and applications for tier three will open on the 12th of November. So tier three applicants need to be undertaking a strategic shift. And a strategic shift is defined as a change in your business strategy, including operational and or supply chain readiness that supports changing your marketing or promotional activities to target a new export market. This means that you need to be targeting a new market for you, so one you haven't exported to before. This definition has changed since the last round. So a change in your product is no longer considered a strategic shift. A strategic shift is now only relevant to expanding to a whole market or economy. So if you're already marketing to one geographic area, i.e. the west coast of the US, you cannot obtain a tier three grant to export into a new geographic area of that market, i.e. the east coast of the US. For tier three applicants, your marketing and promotional activities must be targeting one or more of the key markets that are listed here. The markets you wish to target must be new for your business. Marketing and promoting activities that you undertake that target other markets that are not listed will not be eligible for funding under tier three. 
These key markets have been determined to four tier three, and they represent exporters' diversification interests and preferences, and also Southeast Asian countries. Exporter interests have been identified using survey data and analysis of customs data. And we're also aiming to prioritise Southeast Asian countries, which aligns with recommendations of the Southeast Asia strategy, which is an important government priority. You must be an Australian person. So this could include an individual whose principal place of residence is Australia, a company established under an Australian law or a partnership or trust where more than 50% of partners are Australian. You must hold a valid ABN when you apply and after you've entered into a grant agreement. We verify this at the assessment stage and before making any payments. And you must have conducted your business under that ABN for a minimum of two years at the time you apply for a grant. So the two year period will be based on the date of application. Your annual turnover must be more than $1 million and less than 20 million in the year prior to the application being made. So for round four, this will be for the financial year 2023-24. Your annual turnover is the total sales by the business over the year and relates to your trading income. A profit and loss statement for the 2023-24 financial year will need to be provided to confirm your turnover. You need to have a high quality plan to market. And the plan should tell us what you plan to do in terms of your marketing and promotional activities. This is where you'll also demonstrate that you're expanding your marketing and promotional activities and undertaking a strategic shift to a new key market. The plan must be high quality and unique to your business. To be considered high quality, all mandatory questions must be completed with sufficient detail. And the questions in the plan will be incorporated into the application form rather than as a separate uh, uh, document to be uploaded. You must be able to spend at least $20,000 per financial year of your own money to market and promote your products. This doesn't include the grant amount you're applying for. When you apply, you must demonstrate that you have the capacity to spend by providing a bank statement. And with match funding from the grant, this means you need to plan to undertake at least $40,000 in eligible expenditure per financial year. You can, of course, plan to spend more than that, which may be funded up to the maximum grant amounts for EMDG. You need to provide realistic estimates of planned expenditure in your plan to market. You must match the dollar value of the grant with your own funds. Your total eligible expenditure must at least be double the grant amount you're seeking. So for example, if you're awarded a grant agreement of $30,000 per financial year, your total eligible expenditure needs to be $60,000. The amount in your grant agreement is the maximum you may receive. And if you spend more, you will not receive more grant money. If you spend less, providing it's more than $20,000, you will receive an amount equal to the amount you contribute. You must be fit to receive a grant. This means that you comply with all your tax obligations. You don't have any outstanding disqualifying convictions. You're not under insolvency administration and you're not conducting your business in an unprofessional manner. In total, you can receive up to eight financial years of EMDG, EMDG support since July 1990. The eight financial years doesn't have to be consecutive and this hasn't changed. However, we have now introduced yearly limits for how long you can receive each of the tiers. So within those eight years, the new yearly limits are up to two years for tier one, up to four years for tier two, and up to four years for tier three. 
If you received EMDG previously, you will need to check your grant history before you apply. From round four onwards, the way we calculate a grant year towards the eight yearly limit has changed. For round four grantees, calculations towards the eight years will be based on the number of years within the grant agreement. And if you've had previous grants, the number of grants you have previously been paid. For round four and beyond, grant years will be based on entering into a grant agreement and every period in that grant agreement will count towards the total number of years regardless of whether you reported activity. I'll now pass back to Nirma, who will discuss eligible products under EMDG. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Hello, everyone, again. So we'll go through the second part of this presentation about eligibility. As we heard from Tracy, you must be uh, an eligible person. You must plan to uh, have eligible expenses into the future, and you must have eligible products. So the EMDG Act Division 4 and the EMDG Rules Part uh, 3 give detailed descriptions of what constitutes an eligible product. So on the next slide, we have listed... Um, Firstly, we're going to talk about substantially Australian origin. Apologies. Uh, so your eligible product must be of substantial Australian origin. So, for example, if your goods um, are made outside of Australia, you must substantiate uh, that requirement. So rules uh, 90D talks about that um, you have to uh, satisfy four criteria of an eligible product or eligible good uh, which is made outside of Australia. That is a major change going forward. Um, so far in the current rounds, you would only satisfy three out of four, but going forward, you must satisfy all four. So the goods are made outside Australia and all of the following subparagraphs uh, apply for those. So the assets used to make the goods ready for sale are mainly or substantially based in Australia. The activities resulting in the goods being made ready for sale are mainly or substantially carried on in Australia. A significant proportion of the value of the goods is added in Australia and the making of the goods directly generates employment in Australia. So all those four must be um, satisfied uh, if your goods are made, so made outside of Australia. So as noted earlier, an eligible product can be goods made um, in Australia or outside of Australia. And also other eligible products can also include services. The EMDG rules recognise eligible services under two categories, tourism services and services um, other than tourism services. Tourism services must be supplied in Australia to foreign persons. For other services, they must be supplied to foreign persons in or outside Australia. Again, if your um, goods or eligible product is a service, please look at um, uh, relevant templates on our website to complete those questions and upload with your application. An eligible product includes an event held in Australia as well, or if the event is held online, it must be provided by an Australian person. An eligible product includes an intellectual property or know-how, which must also satisfy the all relevant substantial origin uh, requirements under the EMDG rules. An eligible product also includes software, which must be a work in which copyright subsists, and the work must be uh, the result of the wholly or substantially uh, of work done in Australia. We will also go through eligible, eligible expenses as well. So, as I said, uh, you must plan as part of your plan to market and your application, you must plan to have eligible expenses. So let's spend some time to go through those uh, in this session. Um, you will need to show that your eligible expenses that you're planning to incur are in being incurred in the grant agreement period. And for round four, that is 25, 26 and 26 and 27. If you do not meet those requirements, we cannot make payments uh, under your grant agreement. Your expenses are eligible where they are in respect of promotional activities undertaken during the period of your grant agreement for the purpose of marketing eligible products in foreign countries, and you have also designated connection to those eligible products. So all of this is outlined in section 5.3 in the grant guidelines. Um, just as an, as an example, um, you can maintain a representative in a foreign country for more than six uh, months so far. Um, 
as the representative body, uh, sorry, as a representative of your um, business is either conducting research into the market in that country uh, for your eligible products or undertaking promotional activities to market your eligible products in that country. So this would include uh, expenses such as their salaries and wages, um, office rental costs, their reloca relocation costs, or uh, cost of recruiting um, a replacement for that representative. I also wanted to point out that uh, if you are uh, planning to plan short trips within Australia or to a foreign country, that we have introduced some um, tighter, tighter rules in that, in that respect. So in the past, you could claim up to business airfare cost. From round four, it can only be economy airfare or, or equivalent of that. So if you are traveling a business class, uh, when you come to submit your master report, you must show us that that cost is at the, at the economy airfare level. We have also introduced uh, some limitations to free samples, uh, so you can only claim up to 15,000 uh, for that purpose if you are selling uh, or providing free samples of your eligible product to foreign buyers. You can also claim costs associated with engaging consultant to support your export promotion. Uh, again, this is not grant writing consultants, so that cost is not eligible. Intellectual property rights are also eligible or costs associated with those, promotional and advertising material, and also costs of soliciting a business in a foreign country, which is attending a trade show and costs associated with that. It is also important to understand what is not eligible, so what you cannot use the grant money for. And these are the expenses that are already funded and covered by other financial assistance schemes and grant programs, so there's no double dip dipping allowed in EMDG. Uh, any costs associated with selling your product or um, um, also if, if that sale contravenes the uh, Australian law. Expenses to solicit sponsorships for an event are not eligible. Capital expenses are not eligible. Trade with New Zealand is not eligible either or with any sanctioned country. Paid expenses are not eligible. So if you already paid for something or someone else paid for that thing, you cannot claim it under EMDG. Uh, remuneration or um, remuneration-like expenses are not eligible. Illegal activities, obviously, and expenses or products that might have detrimental impact on Australia's trade reputation. And again, grant writing expenses are not eligible under EMDG. So let us go through the next section of this session, uh, which, which is about how to prepare uh, your T3 application. So there are eight simple steps that you can see on the screen that constitute your preparation and submission of your uh, online uh, application that, that we open in November. The most important thing is to read the EMBG grant guidelines. Please make sure that you pick the guidelines for round four, which is uh, in respect of 25, 26 and 26, 27 uh, financial years. You must also set up your digital identity, which is my um, Gov ID. Um, so again, Austria does not uh, own uh, uh, my Gov ID application. It is managed by ATO, so please contact ATO to support you with that. Uh, but you must have uh, your digital identity to be able to log on into the EMDG online portal and submit your application online. You must also link your ABN through RAM, again, another application managed by ATO. And once you've done that, please uh, test it through the EMDG online portal that it works and it's ready to go uh, for November. You must also have your ANSIC code for your business, which is your four-digit industry classification code. You will be asked to provide that in your application. So as we outlined before, we have published our grant guidelines and supporting documentation for you to have a look at, familiar, uh, read it, I guess, and get your uh, application ready. There is a section called Prepare to Apply and How to Apply on, on the website that outlines all these key steps and also provides you with sample application form questions for your particular tier. So please have a look at that, um, at that document. All those questions will be uh, showing you the online application form later. You can also pre-prepare your answers so you can cut and paste it easily in the online form.
The online form will be structured in a way where we ask you the core eligibility criteria first, so you can fail fast and not waste time in completing the rest of it uh, if you are not eligible for that TM. The key feature of um, the, the application form will be your high quality plan to market. And as Tracy outlined, that is the key requirement for uh, applying in round four of the program. So in the past, if you applied in EMDG in the current rounds, that plan was high level. It could be any document. But going forward, it must be high quality plan and you must answer all questions that are incorporated in the online form. So please have a look at those questions that are currently in the sample form and prepare your answer. So you need to tell us what are you doing now or what have you been doing and how, what do you plan to do into the, in round four in terms of 25, 26 and 26, 27 financial years. You have to select your key markets specifically for T3. So the form, when you log on and select T3, will ask you which markets are you planning to diversify. So the key markets are those 27 markets that you can only select from for T3. So you can't be existing markets if they're not listed. And we suggest that you select one or more. If you are not sure which markets will be, you'll be targeting over the course of two years, we suggest that you select more than one. So because later you may not be able to change them. You also need to tell us how you will measure success and um, be very um, precise and clear what is your budget because that will kind of transpose into the grant amount requested later uh, for, uh, for the funding uh, section of the, of the application form. We have prepared an exemplar plan to market for T3, so please have a look on our website just to give you some guidance how, um, what, what sort of questions are coming up and how they're answered there. So the high quality is important. If you answer questions by one, one line, one sentence, or if you cut and paste from a different business, which we have seen in the previous rounds of the program, your plan to market will be rejected. So we cannot have time going back and forth and asking you for more information. It wouldn't be fair on other applicants that are ready and have submitted a high quality plan to market. So please take time to prepare it and be ready for November. So the application form will also ask you to upload certain attachments depending on the type of your eligible product or service. So please use those templates uh, that are uh, available on our website and complete them to be ready. You will also need to make certain declarations and read certain documents to make those declarations. So just warning you that that will be part of the online application form as well. The application form will also prompt you to uh, attach mandatory evidence uh, to substantiate uh, requirements of, of your tier. Uh, obviously, that you are an existing exporter, uh, that you have export sale invoices proceeding in the year preceding to the, to the application year. You have to substantiate your turnover limit of 1 million for T3. Um, you have to show us the capacity to spend at least 20000 And there were questions earlier in different webinars about how do you do that. So we need, you need to provide us with a bank statement in addition to your balance and uh, sheet and profit and loss statement at the time of applying. We need to see that uh, before we uh, assess your application. And then later, if you are successful and receive a grant agreement, you will be asked to provide uh, another uh, capacity to spend uh, um, evidentiary requirement with your master report for the following year. So at a time of applying, the bank statement needs to show at least 20,000 for 26, 27, uh, 25, 26, and later in master report 26, 27. That you must be tax compliant. So again, in, in the past, we would be asking you during the assessment process to give us that um, uh, evidence. Now we're asking you to do that as, as, as part of your application form. So you can either give us a copy of your business activity statement, your notice of assessment, or your statement of account. If you have tax debt, you must show us your uh, repayment plan with the, with the ATO to demonstrate that you are actually tax compliant. For SMEs that are uh, trusts or operators of trust, um, you, you need to provide a trust, a trust deed, including any amendments. Um, or, and also the application form will ask you for ABN and ACN of the trustee and trust. And again, uh, depending on the eligible product or service, you will need to upload those attachments. So 
So for T3, there will be opening applications at 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, on the 12th of November. So once we open to that tier, uh, and we're also opening with T1 and T2 at the same time, we will be monitoring uh, the demand on, on that tier and the funding, and we'll be updating our EMDG online portal, the landing page actually before you log in, will be showing how the funding is being um, allocated. The funding will be allocated on the grant amount requested, and we will close once that um, has been reached. We will allow for a certain buffer for allowance for ineligible applications or those applications that may be eligible but a grant agreement has not been accepted. So we can release that funding and reallocate to uh, another eligible applicant on the list. So the portal will close. We'll let you know when that uh, happens. Uh, it could be very quickly because we know the MDG is a program with uh, pretty high demand uh, every year. So just to manage expectations, even if you submit your application before we close, you may not be allocated funding because we might exhaust the funding before we come to your application. Just we wanted to be clear on that as well. We won't be accepting incomplete applications or applications that are late. So because when the portal closes, uh, if you request for us to open it for you again, that won't be happening. So incomplete applications will also, as I said, uh, be um, rejected if you do not submit uh, mandatory attachments. Your uh, responses to questions are not uh, clear. Uh, there's not sufficient evidence or information for us to actually assess. We will be um, rejecting those applications. And just before uh, we move on to the questions, uh, just some more information for all businesses and exporters out there. In addition to EMVG, Austria provides other free information and services. Um, there's a lot of information on the Go 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 Toolkit pages at export.business.gov.au about training uh, and advice and market research and insights and reports. So please um, have a look uh, at, the, at the Global Global Toolkit as you are preparing your uh, exporting and plan to markets. Um, okay, so all this information is on our website. Uh, please also email us at emdg.help at or call us on 13 28 78 if you've got any questions. We'll now move on, on to the question and answer section of this uh, webinar. And we'll endeavour to answer most of the questions, but if not, please email us uh, at EMVG Help Desk and we'll endeavour to answer them as soon as possible. All right, let's have a look. Just opening Slido. Okay. It was the first question answered by someone 33 minutes ago. So okay, so maybe I'll start from the bottom. Out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so the question is about, we've got a four-year grants of mm -hmm. Tier 3 from Round 1. Is the maximum limit for Tier 3? So for Round 4, can we apply for Tier 2? Thank you. Um, my understanding is actually um, Round 1, the maximum term of the grant payments for Round 1 is three years. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not sure how you've got four years grants from Round 1, mm -hmm. uh, you know, under Tier 3. Um, yeah. But whatever the term that you've received, yes. you know, so that will be counted towards the eight-year limits and also the, the tier-specific limits as well. Correct. Um, yeah, so for round four, uh, if you reach the maximum limit for that tier, for tier three, mm -hmm. you can certainly consider uh, applying for tier two if you meet the tier two requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Chong. Okay. Next one is, I understand we can't claim yeah. on previous expenses, but can we claim for expenses made from the 12th of November to the date we are approved? Uh, no, no, that, the, the answer to the question is no. So uh, round four is for expenses that you plan to incur in 25, 26 and 26, 27. So we're not retrospectively acknowledging any expenses for 24, 25 in round four grant agreements. Okay. So the next question is about actually, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, can the business in this round four apply for four years for uh, tier three and not mm -hmm. two years now and two years later? And my, my understanding is um, the grant agreement term, maximum grant agreement term for round four is two years. Correct. correct. 
That is right. So I don't think actually we can come to this request by giving this four year no. in total. No, so for round uh, four, it's two years, so you're applying for two years. And then if you're still eligible uh, later on, uh, you can apply for the next round, depending on which year you apply for. So your grant history will count for that purpose as well. Um, so if you have traded the same business under different ABNs, can you include the previous ABN under the two-year ABN rule? No, it must be your existing ABN for at least two years. So you can't mix and match different uh, ABN histories to be able to be eligible. Uh, so, so what are the requirements now about uh, the documental, you know, document requirements in terms of loading the application before there's a question about um, we need to lot the uh, for um, financial year 24 test return before applying for round mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Do we have to lot the return before that? Because test return legally mm -hmm. is due in 2025, you know, for the 24-25 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. year. So do we need to lot the test return early just for the sake of the FDG application? Mm -hmm. Well, it would be ideal if you could have that ready, but it is for um, the, the, your latest, uh, obviously, tax return that you have to, to, to show mm -hmm. that you tax compliant. Mm -hmm. So what the most recent year that you have. Yeah. And the next question, um, got a five likes, and it says, please answer, are, are adverse decisions reviewable? Mm -hmm. And will Australia follow procedural fairness principles of seeking an opportunity to comment before any adverse decisions are made on the applicant's eligibility. Mm -hmm. I think there's two questions, two parts to this mm -hmm. question. The mm -hmm. first question is about are adverse decisions reviewable? Yes, they are, provided they fall under Section 97 of the EMDG Act. So they have to be in one of the four categories of reviewable mm -hmm. decisions to be reviewable. Yes. Uh, second part of the question is actually will Austria follow procedural fairness principles of seeking opportunity to comment before any decision is made. Uh, procedural fairness, um, or called a natural justice, is uh, an adverse, uh, administrative decision-making principle. Mm -hmm. um, the elements to that um, can include also give, give um, pre-warning mm -hmm. to someone about a change mm -hmm. that might actually have an adverse impact on mm -hmm. them. So, for example, you know, mm. we're communicating now yes. about our policies, intentions, how we're going to deal with yes. the applications, first in, first out, yes. and high quality as well. Mm -hmm. This is all part of the procedural fairness mm -hmm. uh, treatment as well. Yes. And also, um, you know, including giving a reasonable notice to people about, you know, any, anything that could adversely affect them as well. Um, so, also procedural fairness have to be considered in the context of, uh, the, you know, the overall round environment itself, you know, whether it's, you know, giving one specific uh, special treatment to one person would actually be seen as a fair to other people Absolutely. who lodge, you know, high quality Correct. applications you know, at the same time. So that's why we should consider one, you know, among the others, and also in the context of the Commonwealth grants, rules and principles, mm -hmm. and CGRPs mm -hmm. as well. Correct. That is right. So that's why we opened uh, or released the guidelines early on, so you can actually understand the changes and get ready to apply. So that is part of the procedural fairness. We are providing examples and templates, and we will be holding a webinar later on in October to show you the actual online form and how, to, how it operates. We'll um, uh, provide an exemplars as well. So that is all part of managing expectations for you to be ready. And then once we open, then applications will be assessed in the order they received. And we cannot spend time going back and forth and giving you another opportunity to fill a gap in your application, given that people who are on the list may be uh, better prepared. So EMDG remains eligibility demand-driven program, and we have to follow the, the rules and principles of that as well. All right. Um, uh, if we select three new markets but end up doing only one of them, would it be a problem with the grant? No, it won't be a problem. So I think uh, it's prudent for you to select more markets that you wish to ex uh, diversify into. And then if you end up just having costs associated with one because your plans change, that's okay. Um, when you come to submit your master report, you will let, need to let us know what has changed in your planning and why you couldn't do it and then upload an update, uh, updated plan to market with your master report. But no, there wouldn't be an issue if you only decided just to go to one out of three. 
Um, We've got a question down the bottom. For tier three, can we use grant money to expand into new markets and support existing markets? Um, so no, a tier three is to is to diversify to new key markets that you haven't exported to before. And tier, tier two is about su supporting marketing promotional activities into existing markets. Mm -hmm. That's right, we cannot uh, mix those two. Um, I'm not sure what this question means. It says, do we need a written and approved grant uh, agreement with EMDG in place prior to submitting the application? So uh, the, the grant agreement follows after we assess your application, so you will receive it later. So just to explain, as I did in the previous webinars, once you submit your application in November, we will be assessing that in the order that we um, receive it. Um, we will be letting you know if you're eligible, send you an email of the outcome. If you are eligible and successful to be offered a grant, we will be, be advising you possibly very early on in 25, maybe later in January 25 after the summer break and give you about um, 21 days to actually accept your grant offer. If you do not accept that offer within 31 days, um, your um, offer will lapse. Um, but if you do accept it, we will co-sign the grant agreement that will constitute your executed contract with the Commonwealth with obligations and terms and conditions. And then from July 25, we will start making payments based on risk assessments for our um, grantees. That would mean that you can start getting your initial payment of at least 20,000 at the beginning of the grant year. And then the milestone portal will open very soon after that. You can start submitting your milestone report to request your second part of that payment for the year and so forth for the second year. So one more we've got is if, if your turnover exceeds 1 million, can you decide to apply for tier two instead or will it cover existing markets? as it will cover existing markets. So yes, um, so tier two eligibility requires that your turnover is at least 500,000. So you can definitely apply for tier two. Yes, uh, there's a technical question about the portal. Can I log on before 10 a.m. on November 11 to start application? No, unfortunately not. Again, for procedural fairness purposes, everyone gets the same start time and we cannot allow people to go in earlier and start filling out the application form. It wouldn't be fair. Uh, FAQ is being provided for round four. So if you look on our website and the, even the grant guidelines, they're written in, in an FAQ format. So there's sections uh, with, with key, clear headings and answers to them. So please have a look on our website first and uh, read the guidelines. If any questions are not answered, please email us at emdg.help and we can consider adding any um, questions to our website if really that information is not covered by the content on the website. But at this point in time, we are not publishing FAQs. Okay, there's um, another question, a uh, technical question here. Can a business submit multiple claims if they own multiple ADNs with the separate tax returns, of course? Um, my understanding is actually if you call the business a business, mm. which means that the business actually is a business. Yes. If it has multiple ABNs, mm. I don't know the reasons behind you know having multiple ABNs behind one single business. Mm. Um, you know, we would actually look at this, um, yeah. you know, from our personal perspective, you know, to see whether this is actually in substance just one. Business that is right, yes. So what is different between those businesses? Is your eligible yeah. product still the same? Like we will look at that. As I mentioned before, cut and paste, identical claim to markets, that is no longer eligible in EMDG. We had many issues with the current program and that's why we really ask you to look at your strategic, unique high, you know, application for your business. Um, and it's only one application per ABN. So we can't have different ABNs applying under different T's and trying their luck. That That is no longer, actually it never has been in EMDG allowed that you have multiple applications across these under one ABN. Yeah, just one. And then if... Yes. But if 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 the uh, the person was talking about more like there's a group of companies, right? Yes, that, that could be different scenarios. Yes. What we're talking yes. about distinct. Yeah, yeah that's right. Businesses. The distinct business um, branches um, that actually deal with the different products and mm -hmm. promotion activities and have a different ABN identities. Of course, you know yes. we'll consider that. That's a separate separate. Yeah, that's yes. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
Is there a template application form that we can access the draft answers prior to opening the business? Yes, absolutely. As I mentioned before, if you were on the call, uh, on our website, there's a section called, uh, called Prepare to Apply. There's Steps How To, and there's also a sample application form for T3 that you can have a look at. Look at the questions and start preparing. It's a Word document that you can use to cut and paste later to the online form. Got a question about limits, uh, the yearly limits. If we've received three years of tier three, the new guidelines state that we can technically only receive one more. So yes, correct. Yeah, we can apply for two years at tier two. Yes, correct. They are the, uh, you know, we, we've selected yearly limits, tier one, two years, and for tier two and three, it's up to four years. Um, we've also got a question along the same vein. If only eligible for one year, do you still need to complete the application for two years of information, i.e. the plan to market? Um, so no, you only need to complete the application form for one year. Tracy, there's a question about what constitutes a new market. So does this mean no existing um, sales in that market? Can personnel be located there already? So. If you export it or have existing export sales in that market, that is not new market to you. So you, it's basically you never exported before to that market. But you already, uh, if you're preparing to get there and you've got personnel or staff there, that should be okay. It's, it's about the export sales that we're interested in. Yeah. yeah. And just follow the, um, so I saw a few questions sort of all relating to mm -hmm. um, if selling online or e-commerce, um, accidentally to uh, an overseas market mm -hmm. would be counted as exporting to the market. Mm -hmm. My understanding actually, by reading uh, the rules itself, actually it indicates that if you export it yep. to the market, it would be counted as you export it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, even if you haven't promoted, but someone yeah. ordered your, your products online and you sold yeah. them, that, that constitutes to yeah. be an export. export. So, yes. Um, Tracy, there's a question about strategic shift. Maybe we can go back to that slide. Uh, and, and clarify it again, if that's okay, Jordan. Sorry, Nora, I don't know what question we're looking at. Uh, can you what please you clarify mean? strategic shift requirement again? Yeah, so um, strategic shift, we've got a definition. I think it's the next slide down. Um, so it's a change in your business strategy um, that supports changing your marketing or promotional activities to target a new export market. So for Tier 3, we're really seeking that you, you target a new export market that you haven't been exporting to before. And also, if you go to the next slide, the markets need to be one of those key markets that have been identified for tier three. So it needs to be on that list. Yeah, uh, just uh, for a quick comment, I saw a couple of questions about, you know, why we use a single economy uh, to define new market, to define the market and not actually country sort of thing. You can see from the list that mm -hmm. some of the economies or markets actually not countries to say, like Hong Kong is part of China. Um, and then, so, the, so they're not actually just countries based; mm. they're markets based. That's what we yes. call a single economy. Single economy. That's yeah. correct, right. Chung, and that's why we're just being sensitive to that. That's why we tend to to, to call them markets. Yeah, just being yeah, correct to express it that but way. Right. Yes, mm. that is right. Um, okay. So, hi team. Um, will the plan to market be a document attachment or is it uploaded as questions in the portal? It is questions in, in the online application form. So, it's no longer a document that you fill and uh, upload. There's, specific, there's a section in the online form that you will see called plan to market and then you answer those questions and key them in. Um, and then that comes through to our system. Uh, there are benefits to it. So, if you're successful in our trade uh, part of Austrade would like to get in contact and support you with the other trade services, they will do so. So that is why we have integrated that plan to market within um, our systems and the form. Will there be open phone lines with staff available 
um, to ask questions while submitting an application. Yes, we will endeavour to, to have support for you, uh, whether that will be 24-7, we need to check on that. Obviously, um, we need to be pragmatic about it uh, in terms of operational requirements. Uh, but yes, we are here to support you. Um, again, if you've got issues with MyGovID, please go to the ATO, have it ready before uh, we open the portal. Oh, there's a question about if you hire an overseas representative of a foreign country, do they need to be an Australian citizen? Can you hire in 25 and add expenses into your 26 plans? Um, there's no requirements that the overseas representative must be an Australian citizen. It can be a locally engaged uh, representative uh, in that country, uh, or it can be relocated employee from Australia. Mm -hmm. And so that's answer to the first part of the question. The second part of the question, can you hire in 25 mm -hmm. and expenses into 26? Uh, Norma has already indicated saying this no. Mm -hmm. It has to be starting from 26. That is the activity right. period. Yeah. That is right. So you're planning for 25, 26, 26, 27 in your round four application. Can a business apply for both T2 and T3 if you cannot serve existing markets and new ones in the, for the same T? No. You have to actually select either T2 for existing markets or T3 for new key markets that we listed. If a grantee um, allowed to submit, or is a grantee allowed to submit a round four application if their 24 milestone report is still outstanding, can they submit it while still awaiting assessment by Austrian and proceed with the round four application? So absolutely, if you are due to submit your uh, 20, financial year 24 milestone report and you haven't done so, you can submit it during um, the, this current year any time that you're ready to do so. The milestone portal remains open for the entire financial year. We will close it just, just before the end of June so we can actually um, acquit the, the funds and assess it. Uh, but in terms of, um, of you uh, submitting your round for application, those two processes are different. So absolutely you can. You don't need to submit your milestone first before applying in round four. So there, there is a question, it looks like there's a bit of confusion. If we haven't exported to the target market before, how do we show to export transactions? So you haven't, if you haven't exported to the target market, that means that's your new market that you would like to diversify into. Your exporting evidence is for your existing market. So you, you need to show us evidence of your existing exporting, trading um, transactions, uh, your sales invoices. So. Um, that's how it works. And they are in 23, 24 financial years proceeding to you applying for the next year. Uh, if you're flying business class, can we claim equivalent economy class fare of the day for that flight? So if you'd like to, you know, purchase um, more expensive um, airfares, of course, you can do that, uh, fund that from your uh, your funds. But what we would like to see in the milestone report when you come to submit is the economy uh, fare equivalent. So if you are booking flights it, and would like to purchase a higher class uh, travel, please also check your, or you know take evidence or screenshot or some sort of uh, evidence that you can show us what was the, the cost of the economy class at the, at the time of your purchasing that. So you can actually uh, show us later. There's a question here about minimum amounts um, and maybe the, the person um, um, hasn't understood. Um, mm -hmm. So for tiers one, two and three, the minimum grant amount is $20,000. However, the maximum grant amounts are different. So the maximum grant amount for tier one is $30,000. The maximum grant amount for tier two is up to $50,000 and the maximum grant amount for tier three is up to $80,000. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. So if there's confusion about if I'm asking for 80,000, why do I just need to give you evidence of 20? Because that 20 is your minimum capacity to spend and also our minimum grant amount, which we may pay you at the start of the grant year so for us to do so, we need to see that you have capacity to spend at least 20000 
or at least of 40,000 eligible expenses at the start of the grantee. So they can give you that 20 at the beginning. And then later, when you spend more, you come with your milestone report and we'll pay you the rest if eligible up to the maximum. I think this brings us to the end of our webinar today. Thank you very much for your engagement, your questions, your willingness to apply in the next round of the program. Uh, we wish you all the best in pre preparing for that. If you've got any questions, please uh, contact us at EMDG Help Desk, and we thank you and wish you all the best.